Today is February the 13th, uh, 2020. I'd like to welcome you to our council meeting. In the interest of time efficiency and ensuring that everyone who wishes to address the council is given the opportunity to do so, the following will apply to all comments made by the public. If you desire to be recognized by the chair, please fill out a request form and present it to the city clerk present here in council chambers. Each speaker shall be allotted three minutes to address the council, unless such time is extended by the mayor or by questions from council. Groups shall designate a spokesperson to avoid repetition of comments. Every effort will be made to avoid interrupting speakers. Thank you for participating in your city government. We ask that you please silence all electronic devices. <coughs> With that, I call this council meeting to order. We ask that you please stand for the invocation by Pastor Jose Sanchez from Family Life Church, and please remain standing after that for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please bow your hand. Dear Father, today we are gathered here to put in your hands the business of this city and to thank you for what you are doing in it. Today, we want to ask you for this community. Lord, you know our hearts. I ask that everything here that will be done and said will glorify your holy name. Bless our mayor, bless each one of those who represent this city here. Give them the wisdom to make the best decision for this city. Will them with your grace and your favor. Father, take care of this city and fill it with your presence and your blessings. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you, Patrick. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Blackwell? Here. Deputy Mayor Matheny? Here. Councilmember Cooper? Councilmember Askew? Here. Councilmember Trace? Here. This time we have a presentation that will be made by our city manager. <clears throat> you know, it's always easy to be a city manager when you've got a great finance team, and I'd like to call the finance team up tonight, let it under the director, Wendy Colazzo, if you guys would come on up, a finance team. These are the unsung heroes of St. Cloud. These are the ones that keep track of your money and the budget and how we spend money here in the city. This is a very prestigious award. It's a certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting presented to the city of St. Cloud finance team, Government Finance Officers Association. This is the 35th year in a row that our finance team has got this award. I think it's significant if I can get it up off of here to present to Wendy Colazzo and her team. Thank you, Wendy, for your leadership. I actually did prep a speech in case just to make sure I did justice to these women and this team. Um, so I thought really long and uh, honestly about how I could portray and thank these um, team members um, and how I could summarize their hard work, dedication to the city of St. Cloud. So um, I thought about an author, um, his name is Frank Ocean, and he stated that to work in silence and let success be your noise. And this is the epitome of what finance does. Um, these, this team represents care, transparency, you know, and planning attention to detail towards the financial transparency of this city. They're the example of financial stewardness 
through silent contributions that many times are lost through the minutia of daily operations. However, their pursuit is always a united vision. It is my honor to recognize them for the 35th time, that is 35 years, in this achievement and distinction that many people cannot claim. Therefore, if success is the noise, this team is a warrior cry across the world that has been for over 35 years. I am humbled um, to have the opportunity to be part of this team and see the incredible dedication and loyalty they not only present to the city of St. Cloud, um, but as a team here um, internally. Um, it is my privilege to work alongside some of the finest professionals I've had the pleasure to do in government. And I continue my promise to always be an asset and never a liability. Thank you for the countless long days and nights, and your success is heard loud and clear. To many more, thank you. On behalf of the entire city council, we would like to thank the finance department for their uh, outstanding work and uh, thank Wendy Ms. Colazzo for her excellent leadership of that department. At this time, uh, we have a update on our water by our department director, Mr. Brian Wheeler. <clears throat> Good evening, council. I I don't have much more to tell you than what you probably heard Tuesday night, but just to let everybody know that the ice picking... Can you pull that mic up? There you go. Okay. Ice picking effort is still progressing as well as we reported on Tuesday. The field crews have said that they uh, were getting the lines clean, and we cleaned our fourth line today, and we'll be finishing up on Old Canoe Creek Road this week and then starting next week into the, re into the residential developments. The first development will be the Canoe Creek Lakes area and then uh, on, on through then there and they are scheduled this again we had to make adjustment to schedule they'll be here a day longer through March 24th and uh, we'll be meeting with the representatives from Suez uh, on Monday to talk about um, what efforts they can uh, extend beyond what we've already done any questions Ms. Matheny thank you um, can you provide an update on the video that was presented at the meeting with the black water black water mm -hmm. yeah that was as as we had said later uh was unrelated to the orange water it was uh apparently a potential stagnant water issue that's a characteristic of, of, of water that it gets stagnated in the in a water line it was uh, released apparently coincidentally with the advent health clinic that's being constructed up at uh, the intersection of part and settlement in 192 they were in the process of making a tie-in to a water line on Thursday up there, and at that time started to flush out the end of the line and got black water at that location, which is almost simultaneous at the same time the house did on Emerald Lakes. We went back um, today, and after looking at the analyzing the distribution system and where the potential stagnant areas could be, went back and flushed those areas, found some dirty water, but none of the none of the, the, the black water, and and the resident that. Uh, presented that water that he was he's the only resident within Emerald Lakes that's reported that that water We didn't find any additional black water within 
uh, Emerald Lakes. Uh, I have been in contact with a consultant that we work with that has done analysis on this uh, for Orange County and Toho Water, and he's going to be you know, getting with us to potentially go in and analyze. Uh, he has several theories on what uh, caused it. So. And then did you do any sampling of that water and send that off for testing? We didn't. We didn't have any of that, of okay. that way, but that's, that's what the instructions were today. If they found any, to grab a sample so we could, we could look at it, so uh, as far as that goes. Okay, thank you. On the areas where you've done the ice uh, pigging, have you been able to um, see the impact with any of the residents, uh, if that has helped or made a significant difference or caused a greater problem at this point? Um, I don't think we have any follow up. I mean, again, this, the, the line that we're, we've been ice picking right now is the main transmission line along Oak Canoe Creek, which actually feeds into the residential development. Okay. So I, I wouldn't expect any substantial improvement from that init initially because we, we haven't really been able to get in and do the lines in the, in the developments. So that's be our first test next week, obviously, when we go to Canoe Creek Lakes after we ice pick in there and having picked the transmission line on Oak Canoe Creek, our expectation would be that we would see some significant improvement there. All right. Any other questions from council? I have one comment. Sorry. Councilmember Matheny. A go backs. And I know I know it was mentioned, but I just want to like elaborate on it. But um, after the meeting that we had this week and I had talked with the um, city manager to see if we could do whatever we could do to expedite any any process that we're doing right now. So um, they are ice picking six days a week and I asked if they could go to seven and I was told they couldn't, they needed a day off. And then um, also, I asked if he could bring something back to council to get more money in place to move forward with the next um, batch of, of lines that we do so that we don't have to wait and get into like a waiting game. Also, um, I know that they have Suez was planning on going to another community, but I asked the city manager, you know, a, what situation are they going to address in the other community? Is it as serious as what we have? Could we ask them to like you know, be patient and let us get some more of our work done. And so I know that he was working on that too. So, you know, one of the conversations I had with the city manager was like, let's try to get everything in line and expedite it as, mo as much as we can so that we don't have any gaps or delays. Very good. I certainly think that's the consensus of all of us. Do you have anything to add? No, I was just going to say we actually are going to just extend the contract with Suez. I'll be bringing back that on the meeting on the 27th. We are, they are already under contract. I'm going to ask for some additional funding also so we can keep working. Thank you. Very the twenty seventh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Thank you. At this time, we have another report on the repair of Old Canoe Creek by the police station tractor supply by Nassim Pandor. A little bit lower. Uh, Nassim Gandor, Public Works Director. So here to give you an update for Old Canoe Creek Road, the repair that's being done. So I have uh, two pictures to show. The first picture is uh, the contractor's equipment working on the stormwater pipe replacement. As you can see, contractors out there mobilized with uh, two, uh, machine, well, two heavy machinery right now and also some uh, smaller machinery working on uh, getting, working to progress forward with the Old Canoe Creek Road repair. Uh, additionally, in this picture, you can see that the, the contractor has active uh, dewatering pipes around there because in order to do a repair in a stormwater ditch, they have to um, get the water out of, the, out of the ditch, which is typically submerged in water uh, all year round as well. And then uh, what you can't see in this picture is uh, the pumps that they have uh, on the, uh, for this project to help divert the water coming upstream to go, uh, to go downstream as well. So the contractor is going, uh, making sure that uh, the work is being done safely and also in consideration of uh, the other uh, obstacles that they have to do and w when you work with uh, projects typically submerged in water. Uh, here is another picture of the uh, pipe, uh, one of the new pipes uh, being placed. Uh, this is on the upstream side where the head wall is being placed down into uh, the ditch. As you can see as well in this picture, uh, there is some uh, utility pipelines that uh, cross that area, which the contractor uh, had to uh, maneuver around and also take into consideration as well. Uh, so to, to date, the, uh, the uh, project's moving forward. We have uh, we had delivered all six pipe sections to uh, meet the 100, uh, 100 feet long. Uh, of the six, three pipe sections are in the ground and set in the ground. 
and uh, the contractor is working to uh, get the other ones set into the ground and uh, stabilized as well. So progressing forward, I'm sorry, progressing forward, uh, you know, the contractor has uh, every intention to battle the uh, weather setbacks, or excuse me, the weathers that we've been having, uh, moving forward to have it completed by the end of the month. Good. Councilwoman Trace? No, that was my Did question. question? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Be done. And just to clarify, just, uh, I mean, the contractor may be working uh, past the end of the month just to take care of sections in the stormwater area, but uh, road access to be open by the end of the month currently. Councilman Rascu. I appreciate you working on that. Um, do we have something in plan in place to check all the rest of these culverts and uh, bridges and things like that? Yes, so sir. Um, uh, to date, uh, the uh, Save St. Cloud Public Works uh, Stormwater Division has inspected uh, the, uh, the other stormwater pipes. So there was 15 in total, which is uh, control, uh, controlled by the city and one that's uh, for with the county as well. So everything that's inside the city uh, air, um, area has been inspected and uh, there, currently there's no pipe uh, that we've determined to have that require immediate action and we're finalizing a report for a plan in place to take preventive maintenance uh, actions. Excellent. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, we're certainly grateful for staying on top of this and, and proceeding as rapidly as possible. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the leadership. And I would like to introduce my good friend, Joe, with the fire chief. <laughs> We'd like to recognize Mr. Silvestri at this time, Chief Silvestri, who's going to give us an update on two homes that were lost in our community. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council Members, and City Manager. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to take a moment just to kind of describe what took place Saturday evening and then give you an update at the end. <clears throat> So at approximately 1.30 a.m. Saturday morning, the Communications Center received a, a call advising a structure fire at 900 Alabama. And the call was processed and FD units were dispatched. As units were being dispatched, their worst nightmare was coming to a reality. They were very familiar with this residence and the family. Long-standing history between the two. The assistant chief, who was on duty, realizing it was the foster's home, immediately requested two additional engines and a rescue. These engines would never come, and I'll get back to that. As the rescue arrived, or one of the rescues arrived on scene and located themselves at 10th Street, they advised of another structure fire off of Georgia, the Baxter's residence. As they were arriving on scene, the assistant chief at the Foster's residence, they reported heavy fire involvement in the rear of the structure, heavy black smoke coming from the second floor and reports of trapped occupants. Crews immediately went into rescue mode, deployed lines, established water supply, making rescues, suppressing the fire, and throwing ladders. At the same time, the comm center was calling for additional units to report to Georgia fire, and that's where these two additional engines were, would end up responding to. That night, the crews were faced with many challenges. They were coming out of a dead sleep and going to 100 miles an hour. Darkness, minimal lighting on the street in the home, there were trapped occupants, which were non-ambulatory, and some of those were on vents, so they could not self-extricate. Compressed O2 bottles were exploding in the rear of the ex exploding, exploding in the rear of the structure. And there was another working structure fire just two blocks away, and you could see the glow. And the thing that scares me the most is I have a very young, tenured firefighting workforce, and I'll get back to that. As I was notified and briefed on the fires and was making my way to the scene, many thoughts were running through my mind. Um, in conversations with the ops chief, did not settle them. Significant structure fires, I had trapped victims, it's early in the morning, uh, resources were minimal, uh, city coverage was exhausted. Um, I have a young fire department, experience level is really low. And I remember thinking, just no one get hurt, and no one get killed with no fatalities. And the reason for that is when these fires happen, you have trapped victims, the stress level in firefighters increasingly increases, and they will take risks that normally they would not do. They will push themselves to the limit, and they will push their equipment and their gear to the limit to make sure that the rescues happen. <clears throat> this, this event would have challenged the most experienced chief officers or large department, and we were lucky, and here's why. Staffing was full. I had engines that were at four personnel, which are normally at three. 
I had rescues at three personnel, two firefighters and one student, and those students happened to be St. Cloud Fire Rescue employees going through paramedic school. Police units on scene staged and were quick to go to action and start doing rescue operations. The crews were familiar with the residents because they have a long-standing relationship with that family. There was a su fire suppression system within the home that actually contained the fire on the, from getting onto the inside too much, but it did make, it way, make its way into the attic space. And a fire suppression system in a home is not normal. Uh, no firefighter injuries or civilian injuries or fatalities happen. Calling of additional resources early helped minimize the effects of the Georgia fire impacting an exposure home that was to the right of it. And we have been training extensively in search and victim extrication and fire conditions over the last couple months. So we were well prepared what was going to take place. When arriving on scene and passing both scenes, I was thinking to myself, God, I hope there's no injuries or fatalities. Um, you know, going through uh, both scenes and seeing all the apparatus, and there was probably over 40 firefighters on scene. I made my way to the command post. I was briefed by uh, the operations chief and the assistant chief, and I could tell by their face they were mentally exhausted. But they also had a sign of release. There was no fatalities and no injuries. We ended up transporting six patients to St. Cloud Hospital and one to Osceola Regional, and all were in stable conditions. I was then briefed by the Osceola chief of no injuries, all occupants were out, and they had a good fire attack uh, and no injuries. As I felt a sign of relief, I uh, assessed both the structures and the personnel, and um, I was thinking to myself, this could have gone the other way so easily. And, and thank God, and here's why. Here's, here's the following reasons for that. If the call didn't come in this way but came in the opposite way, I guarantee you we would have had injuries or fatalities in that fire because they would have responded to the other fire and not the fire with the life hazard. If we were at minimum staffing, the task that needed to be done on that scene would have been delayed and the rescues would have been delayed and the rescues that did occur would have to be addressed and they would not be able to go back into structure because they had a patient they had to deal with. We called for resources early, which was great um, for the other structures involvement that we were able to get those units in route very quickly to address that. If we would have never known of that other fire, I couldn't guarantee you that we wouldn't have had two structure fires at the time uh, someone recognized that. We had three on a rescue to assist with patient care, which means that we were able to pass that patient off and go back in and do other research or other rescues. Um, if we wouldn't have had that third patient, patient, third occupant on the rescue that night, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We also knew the structure layout because we had been there many a times, and that's not common either. And if we didn't, that means searches would have been extended and time delayed. They had a suppression system which helped keep the fire in check, and if that suppression system would not have been in place, the progression of that fire would have quickly, quickly overcome the occupants. And the other thing is all units were available, um, which assisted us in getting a lot of units on scene quickly and getting tasks completed very quickly. I just want to express publicly how proud I am <laughs> of the men and women of this fire department. The police department, the comm center, Osceola Fire Rescue, Kissimmee Fire Department, the professionalism and commitment to service and community was highlighted this Saturday morning. I want to say thank you, and you should all be very proud of their actions that night. The positive outcome has contributed to the great relationships and partnerships we have with other public safety partners, Osceola Fire Rescue, Kissimmee Fire Department, and I want to do a special call out to the comm center for a small comm center to work two working fires with multiple units with trapped victims um, is a testament of their professionalism and their commitment to the city. It, it, to, coming from a large organization, the things that this city faced that night handled it 
with the most utmost professionalism and like they were just the most experienced fire department. And they are. I do have some experienced people, but I also have a huge workforce with little experience. Um, so thank God for the training. I would be remiss, though, if I don't talk and highlight some of the challenges that we face that we're going to talk about here in the next upcoming workshop about staffing levels and depths of resources, a dedicated aerial truck, uh, the importance of fire stations, and, and you know, enhancing our communication center. Um, and I'm sure that we're going to have some good conversation and come up with some great opportunities to address those needs. Right now, both fires are under investigation, and it's probably going to be a couple weeks before I hear back from the state fire marshal. I know that they're working with uh, PD and the fire department uh, on a task force trying to get all the uh, information they can to try to come up with uh, some kind of reasoning what took place that night. But I have some of the firefighters, and I have, I believe, Chief Walls is here tonight from Kissimmee Fire Department. And again, I just the relationships that we have and the dedication of these men and women back here um, I'm humbled to be their fire chief and absolutely amazed in the training that we're doing with these younger firefighters that we have that just went into action and went back. I asked one of the uh, female firefighters who you'll see in the videos if you haven't seen it, someone going into the second floor and doing vent enter search um, task as fire lit up above her head in the attic space. And I asked her, I said, what were you thinking? She goes, I was thinking a lot of things. I said, no, what were you really thinking? She goes, all I was doing was relying on the training that we were doing. And that's what it's all about. That night, they didn't have time to think about what should do or do, and they acted instinctively, and that's because of the training that we're doing. So anyhow, I just wanted to publicly uh, give you a briefing on what actually took place and the significance of the events that occurred that night and give recognition to these people behind you uh, that dedicate their lives to other people. So thank you. questions <laughs> thank you any questions well I would certainly like to say uh, what an amazing job that the, you have done lives were saved and to see how the fire department the police department the call center all work together uh, is the reason that uh, this thing came out as successful as it did and I just uh, thank all of those first responders for your bravery uh, your training paid off and uh, uh, we're just incredibly proud of what you've done. Thank you so much. This brings us to our Citizens Forum. Any person who desires to comment on any item not in this agenda is provided this opportunity to address the City Council. Each person is requested to complete a signing form to be provided to the presiding officer prior to or as soon as is practical thereafter the person addresses the council. We'll ask that when you come forward, you please state your name and address for the record. And uh, please limit your comments to three minutes. And we have some new monitors installed so that you can see how much time that you have left. Christina Montalvo. Good evening, Councilman. My name is Christina Montavo. On behalf of myself and my family, I want to thank all of you for allowing us to host the Nicole Montavo Awareness March right here in our hometown, and especially at Nikki's favorite spot, the St. Cloud Lakefront. She would be honored as she used to spend countless hours there with Elijah, riding her rollerblades as Elijah zoomed past on his scooter, excited that he was winning. It truly means the world to us that you guys have been so supportive of this march. Each and every one of you are much appreciated and hold a special place in our hearts. We hope to see you all there in support of this cause and raise awareness and hopes to a brighter future for other families just like mine that are working through their battles that come along with domestic violence. Thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity and thank you for those involved for making this march I look forward to working with you all in the future. 
Any questions? Could you share with us the date of the march again? The march is March 21st, 2020 at 10 a.m. Uh, there are not enough words to even begin to express um, the heartbreak and the sorrow at your loss, but you have been in our prayers, uh, and we look forward to helping support this, and we thank you that uh, you're stepping up and trying to make a difference with domestic, awareness, uh, domestic violence. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. I'm going to use my voice and make sure people are aware of domestic violence and what it causes in hopes for our other families to have better futures. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Peters. All right. I heard a city summary of the meeting the other night, and I kind of wanted to get a little bit of my own summary of it and uh, also ask maybe something at the end. Um, the, the, the meeting last Tuesday about the water a lot of the residents here have been having dirty water, orange water, bad smelling or high bleach smelling water, and even some with black water, which we found is a different issue, but that's okay. All of us get are enough. Most of this is due to cracks in the polishers at the water plant that cause the resin that they add to clean the water leak into the drinking water, which is not supposed to happen. To fix this, the city is doing a procedure called ice pigging that pushes the ice through the pipes to clean the resin out. They are spending almost a half million dollars to do this to 8% of our community. It'll take 33 days to get that 8% done. The portion they are working on is going to be their guinea pig to see if it will work. They have no idea if it will or not. And they said in the meeting they have no backup plan, no plan B. The kicker is they aren't going to clean the main pipes leading into the places they're ice pigging. So the pipes that are leading into it are still going to have the resin, and they're going to clean behind it. They said the main pipes are too big to ice pig with the equipment they're using. So they're going to spend a half a million dollars to clean pipes that still have dirty ones feeding into them. The worst part is they can't measure the amount of resin that is currently in our water. Even if they could, there's no standard of what's safe to drink. There were people at the meeting with stained appliances, toilets, clothes, etc., and it won't come out. What do you think it's doing to our kidneys and our liver? People have been talking about health issues, itching and burning skin. The health department says the water is safe to drink, but that's because there's no known test for this resin. It's a fairly new water treatment process. Before this, it's never been intentionally added to the water at the water treatment plant. So there isn't a, no, a reason to test for it. I'm just wondering at this point if you guys have something as a good faith effort, maybe, I don't know, filters to each of your residents. I don't know if maybe for their kitchen sink and their showers. So they're not drinking and, and eating with this water, and maybe they're not showering in, in mucky orange water resin. And that's, that was my question at the end and my summary of what happened at the meeting. And I don't know if you have any questions, or that's my question to you. Very passionate about this. It's been going on for years. First of all, thank you for sharing. And our city manager at the meeting, he promised that he would bring back a plan of what we yes. felt like we could do to provide some kind of assistance and compensation. But I promise you, this, you know, we inherited this situation. Our city manager has been did. working diligently, and the city council has been supporting all the efforts, and we will continue to do that until this issue is remedied and resolved. And uh, I, I it's certainly a brand new, and we, we didn't expect. And uh, we just ask for your continued pay. You've been incredibly patient thus far. Thank you. But, Nate, but Mr. Mayor, the one, one thing, I'm, I'm a little disappointed because I had a meeting with you, as you know, um, we had a, a meeting last year, and I did bring this to your attention. And I was, I'm a little disappointed that you brought up that you're going to look into the health issues now, and I gave this to you last year. Yes, ma'am. And I hope that you look into the health issues a lot quicker than you did from the last meeting. Well, thank you for sharing that. With that you. has been an issue, okay. and that has been pursued, and is being pursued. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Sorry. Would anyone else like to speak? Would you please step up? State your name and address for the record, and then please fill out a form before you leave. Stephen Kleiner, 4780 Cypress Forest Lane, St. Cloud, Florida. Why are we going ahead with that half million dollars when we know we're going to have to come back and do the rest of the pipes and the pipe that's in front of that, which will push more back into the area that we are spending the money on? We've already been told that we can't do it unless they have the double machine that's going to do the 24-inch. 
why have we spent a half million dollars that we know we're going to have to spend again to do that same section? And why hasn't it been inspected? They do make cameras. They do have, they do this all the time for sewer systems. They can put a camera into the pipes and they can see how much residue there are. Why are you spending a half million dollars and we don't know what we're doing yet? Why hasn't that been discussed and why hasn't it been looked at? Thank you very much, Mr. Wheeler. Would you like to speak to that? As I told the, the residents on Tuesday when we worked with uh, Suez, uh, they didn't have the, did not have the availability of having two trucks to do the 24-inch at the time period we had. As I, as I certain the council has committed, said to me, and you said to the residents, and I said to you, uh, we wanted to get relief, some relief, as, as quickly as possible. The ice picking group was available uh, at this time period after the first of the year, and to bring to bring to bring them in. Uh, so we've done that. We're aware of the issue with the 20 with the 24 inch line. We have, would be monitoring that. We've done some flushing out there to determine if there's resin in it. We haven't pulled any resin up, but I'm not. I, I feel certain that there is some resin in the 24 inch line, but. The work we're doing on the transmission lines on Old Canuck Road and within the residence well, is going to clear out a substantial part, part, of, part, of the, part of the resin. And as I said, we're continuing to have conversations with uh, Suez about when we can get, the, that, get that availability and uh, bring them back. Uh, do we not have any idea whether this was going to work or not? We had some level. Of, I wouldn't have come to ask you to spend a half million dollars if I didn't think there was a substantial uh, chance of success. But at the same time, not until we see it work, were we really ready to uh, commit all of our resources to do this to do this work. So again, I think we're doing the uh, the appropriate pr process going forward, and we're going to continue to work to do the to move forward to clean the, the system and get it back online. Thank you, Mr. Sturgeon. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler, I just have a quick question. Um, he did ask about the cameras. I'm, I'm not familiar with that process. That, and, well, and that the, there's two different types of technology. You, the cameras that are used in sewer systems, you can't use in water in water lines. It's a whole different lot tech, not technology. But uh, but there is there is technology that you can potentially get into a water line, a pressurized water line, and and and, and look inside of it. So, is that something we can look into doing? I, I've I've already initiated that. I figured you did. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Would anyone else like to speak to the one more question, Brian? I'm sorry, I didn't see your light. Can we can we use a physical pig to do the 24 inch pipe? Do you we can have a pig insert point. Well, let's understand a couple of things. I don't want to get into a long yeah. discussion here, but but the issue is the 24 inch line is the main line that comes out of the plant. Mm -hmm. To do anything in terms of cleaning the 24 inch line, you've got to shut the water plant down. Obviously, with that to mean the main water plant, there has to be a lot of planning and a lot of looking at how you're going to accomplish that. To do a physical to do a physical pigging, you actually have to take the line out of service and open it up, and so that's really not an not an option because in that situation, the water plant would be out of operation for a substantial period of time, which we obviously can't 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 mm -hmm. do in that situation. Okay, I, yeah, I just didn't know if we had a big insertion point. Right, right. Thank you. This brings us to our consent agenda. The next portion of tonight's meeting is consent agenda, which contains items that have been determined to be routine and non-controversial. If anyone in the audience wishes to address a particular item on the consent agenda, now is the opportunity for you to do so. Additionally, if staff or members of the City Council wish to speak on a consent item, they have the same opportunity. First of all, does anyone on the Council have any concerns with any consent agenda items? I'd like to pull item D. Mr. Trace would like to pull item B. D is in dog. Did you say B or D? D is in dog. I'm sorry. D. Why don't we deal with that now then if there's no other items? Resolution number 2020-020R. I'm fine with uh, the two traffic signals that we're doing there. I just want to bring up that I think we really need to look into um, the traffic signal for Deer Creek. That is, that is a rather large community to have a lot of folks turning, uh, trying to turn left out of there on a road that has, I think, a 55 mile an hour speed limit. I think it might be 45 right there, but it's, it's really difficult for residents to get out of there. And I see long 
um, lines of uh, folks trying to turn out um, in the afternoon and in the morning. Is that it? Yep. I just want to see if we can get a consensus to try to bring that back of, I'm sure we'll have to do a... Is that county or city? City streets in the neighborhood, but then uh, Canoe Creek there, I believe, is the county. I think you'll have to coordinate that with the county. Yeah. Okay. Well, can we get that process going? It's going to take a year to get anything done and designed. I'm, and I'm fine with a warrant analysis. I mean, yeah. we have to, like, it has to be warranted at mm -hmm. the intersection. Yeah. So if we, I guess, ask the city manager to coordinate so with the county. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll work with the county agreement. to do that. We'll do You'll the warrant, check on that. warrant analysis. All right. And come back to the count. And if we can look at DOT funding as well uh, for some of these traffic signals. Nothing gave me the thumbs up, so we're good. Okay. Perfect. Would anyone in the audience like to speak to the consent agenda? Motion to approve. I have Second. a motion from Council Member. I'm not going, Mr. Askew. Second. And a second from Council Member Trace. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Bethany. Aye. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Again. This brings us to public hearings. I believe you'd like to have items 1, 2, and 3 read together. And uh, council action number one. Ms. Krug. Final public hearing for ordinance number 2019-46, an ordinance of the city council of the city of St. Cloud, Florida to annex into the city of St. Cloud approximately 10.23 acres identified as preserved at Lakeside, located north of 10th Street, east of Crawford Avenue, west of Old Hickory Tree Road, in accordance with voluntary annexation provisions of chapter 171.044 Florida statutes. Final public hearing for ordinance number 2019-47, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, assigning a future land use designation of low density residential to approximately 10.23 acres identified as preserve at Lakeside, located north of 10th Street, east of Cross Crawford Avenue, west of Old Hickory Tree Road, providing for amending the official future land use map of the comprehensive plan following the Planning Commission's recommendations and proof of publication of applicability and effect survivability copies on file and effective date. Final public hearing for ordinance number 2019-48, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, assigning a zoning district of PUD plan unit development compatible with ex existing low-density residential future, future land use designation for approximately 10.23 acres identified as preserve at Lakeside, located north of 10th Street, east of Crawford Avenue, west of Old Hickory Tree Road, and providing for the entering the designation of the official zoning map following the Planning Commission's recommendations, proof of publication, severability, and effective date. Request City Council's approval for the Preserve at Lakeside Preliminary Subdivision Plan. Thank you. Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. Um, this is, the first item is the final public hearing for the annexation of 10.23 acres. It is an encumbrance annexation. Um, and what that essentially means is that it is an annexation that was initiated by the city. If you recall, um, back in 2017, they submitted an application, and the council um, at that time denied the annexation request. So subsequently, based on our joint planning area agreement and interlocal agreement with the county, they were able to go to the county to seek the necessary approval for the development. However, they aren't able to develop an urban density until they get a water and sewer agreement with the city. And so they have since come back for a water and sewer agreement. And um, part, part of that water and sewer agreement indicates a requirement for agreement to annex into the city at the time that it's contiguous, which it, it is. And so the city council directed staff to bring this item back for annexation. Um, so we have the notice of encumbrance that was signed in April of 2019. And as I said, it meets the criteria for the state statute 171.044 Florida statutes regarding con contiguity and reasonably compact. It's again, it's adjacent to the city limits. And the existing land use is future land use is low density residential in the county and would also be low density residential in the city um, once it's annexed into the city. It's compatible with the surrounding area and there are no adverse impacts to services at this time. 
is consistent with their strategic goal for growth management. DRC at their meeting in November 2019 recommended approval of 2019-46 for the incumbents annexation, and the Planning Commission um, also recommended approval of 2019-46. Moving on to the next item, which is the comprehensive plan amendment. It's for the same property. Um, when the points of property is acting as a city, it has to get, then get a future land use designation within the city limits. The existing future land use, as I said, is low density residential in the county. The proposed future land use would be low density residential in the city as well. It's compatible with the surrounding area, and as I said, there's no adverse impacts to city facilities at this time. Again, it's also consistent with our growth management um, goal for our strategic plan. DRC at their meeting in November recommended approval of Ordinance 2019-47. The Planning Commission also recommended approval and transmittal to the Department of Economic Opportunity for Ordinance 2019-47. We received no comments from FDEO on January 29, 2020, and City Council, we recommend that the City Council adopt Ordinance 2019-47. Moving on to the zoning, um, the requested zoning would be planned unit development and also indicate a preliminary master plan and final master plan. The existing land zoning again is, is low density residential. The proposed zoning would be planned unit development in the city. The density is 3.5 dwelling units per acre. It, the project is, has um, 36 single family detached dwelling units, again compatible with the surrounding area and no adverse impacts to facilities. Um, at this time. Again, it's consistent with a strategic goal for um, growth management. And this is a diagram that indicates the layout of this um, project you know, for, for zoning purposes. It shows a preliminary and final master plan that is that was approved in the county. So at this point, we would be accepting the preliminary master plan that's shown on the screen. Um, this is an image of the um, road, road cross-section. It indicates that there will be a widening of the roadway from 18 feet, I think, to 22 feet along that section. And um, this item was discussed at our December meeting for first reading to approve, and there was a motion with two conditions. One was to look at extending the sidewalk to the next nearest road intersection, and the second item was to ensure that it meets the city's tree requirements. And the motion was passed to approve, to continue the item to tonight. And I did contact the applicant to indicate the council's desire, and they indicated that they would be here to discuss. I, didn't, I'm not sure if they're here or not, but they indicated that they would be ready, um, able to comply or to address the request. One second. Um, st staff at our meeting in November, we were bringing an approval of 2019-48. Planning Commission at uh, their meeting on November 2019 also recommended approval and asked that you do the same. And if you desire to move forward with those conditions, that would be conditions that would be added to the ordinance for the zoning, PUD zoning, and it will also be carried forward to the preliminary subject event plan, which is the next item that I'm gonna mention, which is, oops, it's not here. Where do I, hmm, never mind. So anyway, there, there, there would have been a slide there that shows the preliminary subdivision plan, and that item was similar to the, to the PSP, that the, that the PMP that you saw a minute ago, and that um, would have conditions added the two conditions that we mentioned earlier. And with that, um, the applicant is here, or should be here. Is the applicant here? Nope. So Not here, okay. Would anyone in the audience like to speak to these, these items? Please state your name and address for the record. Stephen Kleiner, 4780 Cypress Forest Lane, St. Cloud, Florida. My question is, we're talking at a 22-foot wide between uh, streets, and that's how the width that we will be able to drive down. Is that what is mentioned there, 22 feet? Andre? The existing roadway paved area, I think, is 18 feet, and the county in their approval re recommended 22 feet. That'd be widened 22 feet. 
does 22 feet re, uh, allow a fire truck and two cars to be parked? Is that enough width for a fire truck to get down the road when you have two cars parked opposite each other? I don't believe so. And if that's the case, we're once again creating a problem for our emergency vehicles. And it's happened many times. They cannot get down the street. And now we're approving something to be built that's going to create a problem. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be making it easier for our first responders, not harder. Thank you. Councilman Rothini. Thank you. That 22 feet is 10th Street. 10th Street, I know. It's 10th Street. Yeah. Okay. It's, not, it's not the it's internal. Not the, it's not the internal well, street. What's the internal say? It's already existing. What is the streets inside being set at? It's already existing. Every street has to have at least 20 feet clear. If there's cars parked on either side, there has to be 20 feet clear in the middle for a fire truck to be able to get through. Every every new neighborhood. And we make them post no parking signs. That's the city, though. It. This yeah. got approved in the county. But they have the same. No, they don't. 20 foot standard? That's fire. fire they, have, they don't have it. They don't do 20 feet plus parking on both sides. I mean, the city has has tougher road standards than the county does. Okay, so when we take this over, we can put no parking signs and... I'm sorry, Mr. did we... The applicant's not here? No. But, I mean, understand that we are the applicant bringing it forward, but the yeah. applicant's not here to add, answer specific questions about the project. Well, with the exception of the... Well, I see 20 feet. I see 20 it says 21 feet. Am I reading that right? I see Where 20. The... I can't zoom in. It's on the flat. It... There's 20 feet and there's one street section that has parking and it's got seven feet of parking outside of the 20 feet. Andre's, mayor, it's okay. Yes. Uh, Andre's, uh, does this have 4.5 parking spots per house? Should, because the county adopted the same um, right. sense that we did. Right. Does anyone else in the audience have a question? Council, do you have further discussion? Motion to approve ordinance 2019-46. We have a motion for Council Member Trace. Do I have a second? Second. Second for Council Member Askew, Madam Clerk. Deputy Ramathini. Aye. Council Member Askew. Aye. Council Member Trace. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Was your pleasure concerning the next item, 2019-47? Motion to approve 2019-47. We have a motion from Council Member Trace. Second. Second. Council Member Askew. Madam Clerk. Council Member Askew. Aye. Council Member Trace. Aye. Deputy Member Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. And ordinance number 219-48. What is your pleasure? And on this one, do we need to add the, the caveats that um, they'll put the sidewalk to the nearest intersection? That, that's important. your desire, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, motion to approve uh, ordinance number 2019-48, adding the stipulation that they extend the sidewalk to the nearest intersection and um, maintain the street, uh, the trees within the right of way. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. Second, Councilman Raskew. Madam Clerk. Council Member Askew. Aye. Council Member Trace. Aye. Deputy Member Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. And if we could go to Council Action Number 1. Can I have a motion or discussion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Council Member Askew. Do I have a second? Second. From Councilmember Trace, oh, Madam Clerk. Could I interrupt? And mm -hmm. you'll also need to continue to carry the same conditions over to the okay, sidewalk. Okay, we do well. an Okay. So, a motion to approve extending the sidewalk and adding the yes. tree. Well, the plan, yeah. You can do it. The plan has to be consistent with the PUD, so right. you carry it over automatically anyway, but it doesn't okay. hurt to put it in there. Okay. Carries over automatically. No, that's fine. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Member Matheny. Aye. 
Councilmember Askew. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Brings us to item number four under public hearings. Madam Clerk. Final public hearing for ordinance number 2020 08. An ordinance of the City Council of City of St. Cloud, Florida, amending the Land Development Code of the City of St. Cloud, Florida to amend Table 3-7, Commercial and Industrial Uses, Article 2, Definitions, Article 2, Division 19, Assigned Regulations, Article 3, Division 20, Section 20, Temporary Mobile Vendors, providing for severability, conflicts, codification, and effective date. And I'm um, Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. This is the LDC update to amend certain sections of our land development code, um, specifically to clarify so, and simplify certain uses and definitions and to revise and clarify portions of our sign code dealing with lighting and electronic message centers, as well as to add mobile food vendor regulations to our code. Going through them, very, um, you, you already heard this the first time before, but I'll go through them just very quickly. One first one is to address um, expanding the definition and types of um, types of micro um, beverage manufacturing that can occur in the city. Right now, we have only I list only two, so we expanded to say micro beverage manufacturer and include the list that would include beer, wine, spirits, mead, and cider. We also um, are adding a definition for a mobile food vendor. And we're also addressing uh, window signs to also include the, um, the, the frame as part of the uh, portion that, that a sign can be attached to. Um, Division 19 sign regulation specifically, we are addressing the incandescent tubing and LED light strips that they'll be permissible in certain instances and that if they're integral to the decorative or architectural feature of the building and also that they're not connected to signage and the type that's antique filament style or temporary holiday lights would be permissible. Um, as far as non-conforming signs, the lighting is in, identified as being prohibited and were made to be non-conforming are allowed to remain for a period of up to 90 days. After 90 days, uh, they're required to comply. Um, we did provide um, this update to the chamber and they reviewed it and had an informational item indicating that they were concerned that the 90 day was too short and that they would recommend that we consider 180 days. Um, further on the signs, regarding electronic variable message signs, we are updating some standards related to brightness and that there has to be an automatic light sensor that adjusts the um, the lighting to no more than 0 0.3 foot candles above the ambient light levels, and that there's a sliding scale. Well, initially we had a sliding scale, but we have since modified that to be 100 feet from the sign. And that, that wasn't updated, I'm sorry. Um, just to mention, um, currently in the, in, the, in the code, it indicates that lights um, can be on for EVMs between 7 and 9 p.m. and that if the business operates beyond 9 p.m. To, pu to the public, that they can continue to maintain the light. However, the ambient light sensor would, 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 uh, would actually kick in at that point anyway and bring it down to 0 0.3, 0 0.03 foot candles above the ambient light. So just wanted to point that out. Um, Division 20 is regarding the temporary <coughs> Um, or mobile food vendors and um, the um, Division 20. And so we've updated that to now allow that as a um, conditional use within CBD 1 which, and CBD 2, which is the central business districts. And it will require a mini site plan. And um, it will not be permitted on just vacant property. It has to also be an accessory use to the primary use and it has to be entirely on private property. Um, it cannot be any, you, you can view it from the alleyways, that's permitted, however, it cannot be view, viewed from a named street. Um, it must um, also meet the license requirement for the fire department, the state, and other governmental agencies, and an annual permit will be required. And I think that's it. It's consistent with our growth management goals and the ERC recommends approval, and as I said, this chain cloud chamber provide an information item indicating that they would recommend that we consider 180 days instead of 90 days. 
Planning Commission also recommended approval of 2020-08, and we asked the City Council to do the same. Mr. Pete Caporlingua has requested to speak to this item. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Mayor, you're one of the few to pronounce, pronounce, excuse me, pronounce it correctly. Right. <laughs> I am Pete Caporlingua. I'm the Grand Knight for the Knights of Columbus here at St. Thomas Aquinas Church. And our, our concern or question relates to the uh, mobile vending units. We have and we do use a mobile unit. It's a bread truck that makes bread. We have it, we do it six times a year, one weekend out of every month, only during the winter months. We start in November and we end in April. Um, we are going, we, uh, <clears throat> this is just one of the items that we use to raise funds for the St. Thomas Church as well as the 20 some odd ministries that we support. I mean, last year we raised $10,000 in bread sales. 90% of that goes to the church. We also did 4,000 pounds of food collection for the St. Cloud Food Pantry, including a $400 check, which allows them to buy even conditional uh, food. Uh, we support the citizens with disabilities. We just presently presented them with a check for $2,922 for, the, for them to be utilized. And also, we raised $15,000 last year for ultrasound machines. But our primary um, fundraiser is doing bread sales with, at the church. And we were doing one at Tractor Supply, which we have permission, but we all know knows what happened this past weekend. Um, met with the code en enforcement people, which I know from my days at Osceola County School District. Uh, we removed ourselves. Um, I've been working with your staff, specifically Veronica Miller, as well as Aaron Jenks. I have the uh, permit application and a waiver fee application, which I'm submitting tomorrow. I'm told I've been authorized, but trying to get some clarification. We have permission, because I'm also working with Schofield Properties on one of their private properties, and we also have permission from the church. If we are on a private property, as long as we have permits, I mean, I have liability insurance. I'm a 501C. Uh, I have all the proper documents in place. We'd like to know, can we continue? Because this is, this is our major fundraiser. Without this fundraiser, I mean, we can't support the ministries and certainly wouldn't help my council because we'd probably be, we have no other means and methods of being able to do that type of fundraising. The others that we do, uh, Basically, the ultra, ultrasound 15,000, we do laps for life. We all get all the Knights of Columbus and we're out there running around the track. And for however many miles we can possibly run, we raise dollars and cents or so people contribute dollars and cents towards that. So that's really basically what I'm trying to find out is once we fill out these permits and the waiver fees and et cetera, so on and so forth, if we're on private property and we have the permission of the owner, are we permissible to continue? I have two more months in this season, and then next year we start up again in the end of November, and we end at the end of April. That's basically what my concern is for myself and for my council. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Can you speak to this? Veronica Miller, Deputy City Manager. Yes, we have been um, discussing this item several times this week. Unfortunately, the current land development code specifically prohibits mobile food vending in the city limits. The current, unless it's associated with a special event, the current land development code amendment that you're hearing as part of this ordinance would expand and allow that in the downtown area. However, that's not the area um, that the Knights of Columbus are, are selling um, the bread. We've discussed that the only current opportunity to do this would be if there was a special event and he'd have to get a special event permit in order to do that. So some of the other locations potentially would not be 
would not be able to qualify for a special event. He would not be able to currently join the, the relocated farmer's market that is going through the conditional use process right now. He could apply, the church can apply to do a special event on their property. Um, a special event permit is only allowed, and I don't know the, the, quite the number, but it's you have to be expecting like several hundred people, 250 people to attend your special event. The church has that many people that come on, on a Sunday morning when he's selling it, so we're able to call it a special event, but that's because we're trying to work with them. Um, the, the best solution would be that if the city council wanted to consider some, some type of um, other arrangement for mobile food vending, and, and that, that is why I recommended that he come this evening. Okay. Um, now we, I'll give you just another minute. Go ahead. We've heard you. Yeah, I know. Um, when we're over in Tractor Supply or if we're on the Schofield property, during the course of the day that we're there, we probably serve 300 to 400 people. Right. It's not all at one time, so does that still constitute to the requirements of a special permit? Or does it have to be 250 people at one set period? Well, I think that's what we're addressing. You're trying to uh, figure out a way to be able to accommodate special needs and, and special I appreciate events. that. Well, Mayor, just remember the current code prohibits these types of uses. Mm -hmm. So the provision that Mrs. Miller referred to is actually an opportunity for them to get permitted if they, act, if they apply for essentially a special event permit. Okay. Otherwise, they can't. Ms. Matheny. First of all, what is your title? Grand Knife? Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. That's a cool sword. title. You didn't bring <laughs> that is a cool title. I just wanted to it tell you It may that. be a cool title, <laughs> but uh, I get involved in as many phone calls as probably is our mayor here. <laughs> it's a well, very studious. Yeah, that's a cool title. I was like, Grand Knife? Um, First of all, uh, thank you for all the work that you do. And I have not had an opportunity to have bread from the bread truck, but I have heard from many, 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 many people how amazing it is. So I just wanted to say that. Secondly, I find this whole process, like, kind of frustrating and, like, we can't, like, really wrap our arms around it. And so I'm sure everyone on the other side is feeling the same way. Like, I'm not really following why we were going to let the um, farmer's market move to the school field property and that was fine, and we just needed a letter from the owner, and we needed to get insurance, and we needed to do this, which is all the steps that he's done, and why that was okay, because we're somehow classifying them as a food truck. So if they took it out of the truck and put it on a table, it'd be fine. Like, I'm just feeling like we're, we're getting into the ticky-tack here. Like, we've given the rules. We've told the people at the farmer's market at Tractor Supply, do these steps. You can have your farmer's market. He's done the steps, but now we're like, oh, well, you're not, you're not farmer's market. You're a food truck. Well, if I just clear it. So the, the market you're referring to, which is not permitted at the tractor supply by the direction of the owner of their property, which cleared up a, something you were told previously, and is being going to uh, intended to be operated on the school field property. It is not a permanent permitted use on there yet. They are applying for the appropriate permitting under the city's code to do that. They have been granted, as I understand it, essentially a temporary pass to be allowed but to. But why to, can't he follow that same I, process? That's what I'm, I'm that, not understanding. What do we have to do to remove the you barriers? Could, if the council wants to let direct, him do you that. could give this, gentle, this gentleman's group a temporary pass. However, he's temporary still. Temporary pass. That's he's, my motion. If that's a direction, because you've already done it once. Yeah. And as you recall, we weren't necessarily in favor of you doing that, but you'd already agreed to do that once. But he's the the the, the overall point to make is that he's going to there the church, the owner of that property, is going to have to go through the process if he wants to do this more than essentially on a temporary basis. And so, if so, he's got how many months do you have left? You said of the season. Three I months? have. February, uh, March, and April. So can we do a temporary you permit re, you for can't, him? That's the city. You, you really can't even do that. It's kind of up to the city manager. You can give him direction to do that. Okay. Can we do, give direction to the city manager to give him a temporary pass to get him through this season, and then let's work on a permanent fix? I find it, like, 
I feel like the rules are changing like every week. So I know that the people on the other side have to be frustrated too. And I mean, maybe it's a fact of we're trying to help people, which is sliding the rules around, which is making it confusing. Mm. But that's, ex that's exactly uh, right. can we get direction to let him sell his bread for the end of the season and then we'll can, work can on it? Can the council uh, give the city manager? Yeah, that's what he said. Uh, give him direction. You, you can, but, and I'll turn my light off and I'll be quiet after this. But as long as. <laughs> As long as you recognize that the problem you get that staff has and when we have when we draft these ordinances and we set these codes is there's always another entity that wants the similar consideration to deal with it. We, in this, and, and it'll happen again and, in, and we have to try to enforce the code as you adopted consistently and this makes that problematic. Okay, well I would like to give the city manager direction to allow that for the next three months do I have two other can, people? Can we all object to that? It's Council not a motion. Trace, I, I, I'm fine with that. I just want, I have other questions before we move forward with any direction. Sure. Okay, Councilor Trace. Uh, how does the um, hot dog cart at Home Depot function, for, like in our code, versus the mobile vending, versus everything else? Because that's another one that's there Go day ahead. in and day out. Okay. If I if I may, I think that was my case back in like 2004 yeah. or 2005. State your name again. Veronica Miller. <laughs> At the time, the city of St. Cloud did not prohibit mobile food vending. So we went through, we had, the Home Depot had an approved site plan and then we did a mini site plan to have all the departments review that that food truck, the hot dog cart was not gonna be blocking any emergency access points and, and that it met code in all other areas. And so they are a permitted use because of, because of that. I, I think it would be easy if easier if the city council wanted to give us direction to return to you with with another version of the mobile food vending if you wanted to give us direction to work with um, nonprofit food trucks uh, we, we are going to this is going to continue occurring if, if he finds another location that he wants to go to um, that that isn't that tractor supply farmers market or or, or at another the church, church. Or another. right? So so in order to to stop having to keep coming and getting a special dispensation, if if you could give us direction on where you might want us to consider allowing this, then staff can go back and and draft a revision. Councilmember, ask you your lights on. Uh, thank you for that, Brent. Um, it, can you go back one slide? Is that possible? So I have no issue with the bread truck. By the way, that stuff's fantastic. Um, yes, your neighbor tells me that uh, you enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, the only thing I have a challenge with the food trucks is that we, we're saying it's an annual uh, permitted thing, which basically means I'm going to come down here if, I, if it's mine and I'm just going to get my annual permit stamped and move back out. Mm -hmm. The problem I have with food trucks is in, on a property – like mine or anybody else's is that you're you're saying basically we're going to allow the food truck there and it'll stay there pretty much forever until we decide we want it, it removed but it, with an annual permit like that you know a year from now it's still going to be there 10 years from now it'll still be there so i think food trucks are, are good for temporary things bread things like that but to make it a permanent structure on that on that it should be going towards a permanent structure some way of making that thing connected to our water sewer bathrooms, things like that. Just I have a hard time being a commercial person myself, watching people put $100,000 in for a kitchen, and then this person gets to drive up, drop down, and stay there for years. So that's my only my only concern. If there's some way to... Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, like a five-year... Yeah, I don't know, something. I thought we addressed <laughs> that last go-around. Yeah, I don't see it, so that's why... So, Mr. Askey, um, so our interpretation or our intent with the location on the site for the mini site plan is not necessarily that the food truck will be there permanently, but that the location has been designated for a food truck. So a business could actually have a rotation of other food trucks in that location if they wanted to change their cuisine, you know, Chinese one day, Mexican one day, whatever. So it, that was the, kind of sort of the intent that you identify the location where the food truck can be located, but that each food truck would still have to get their requisite permitting sure. and so on. So, but then if you want to, uh, but we did discuss this sort of this graduation where you, you're there for a year or whatever, and then you graduate and say, okay, you're either going to be there permanently or you're going to go to a brick and mortar facility. Yeah, so. it's almost like 
in nine months, come back to me, show me your mini site plan, pay your money for your city night plan, and figure out how you're going to connect to the city by year two, you should be ready to go. Right. I don't so know. I'm as, just throwing it out there. As the deputy city manager mentioned, if you'd like to direct us to connect up with some better language, we can surely do that and okay. come back to you with some suggestions on how we can address that. Because we did discuss it, but we didn't um, draft anything for you to consider. Right. Okay. Mr. Peach, you got 15 more seconds. You got something else you'd like to say? <laughs> no, everybody has <laughs> said a lot. I want to thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. And <clears throat> we will be at the St. Thomas this Sunday. We already have our permission. And you're all welcome to come. And I might, since I am the chairman and of that uh, particular event and the grand night, you're all welcome to a loaf of bread, whatever type you want. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. So, so we need. Can we make? Can we give direction to the? I'm clear. We're good. That. Yeah, everybody's. Yeah. Well, before we do, thing. before we do, I have someone else who wants to speak to this issue. Let's make sure we okay. don't have to back up again. Megan Holmberg. Are you speaking to the same issue? I am, kind of in a different. All right. from a different perspective. Uh, Megan Holmberg, 3511 Harlequin Drive. My interest in this ordinance is as someone who works for the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, and as we're developing some new community building and fundraising activities uh, that we might be interested in having food trucks on our property, I just wanted to ask if there might you might give some consideration to adding some language that would specifically address nonprofits and the you know, Knights are one of our affiliated ministries that they will be there on an annual That's basis. Great. And staff has been incredibly gracious and helpful working with us, city manager's office and parks to kind of figure out what we're going to do in the short term. But we would like to figure out how this is going to affect us going forward because this is um, a very long-standing and successful uh, fundraising drive that they have. They support not just our uh, church ministries, but many community ministries such as the food pantry and the free clinic and our general fund that goes to help any general citizen of St. Cloud that comes to the church for help. So. I don't want to have to do a special event, a uh, $250 fee and the whole process and go through that every single time they need it because special event doesn't uh, address non-consecutive dates. Um, so I just would ask for your consideration as you're going back to look. I think you've already agreed to go back and look at it. But if you could give some consideration to nonprofits, uh, what we might be able to do, you know, kind of on an annual basis on our own property. So. Thank you very much. We appreciate all that St. Thomas uh, does and the Knights of Columbus to make a difference in the community. You guys do a, do a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else need to speak, would like to speak to this item? Now, Mr. Askew. That's a great idea. It, it, could there be some wording in there about churches that have property, things like that, that we can put in there and factor it in? Sure. I think that's yes. a good idea. I think you have to bring, we're going to bring it back. Bring back right. something yeah. you can, that's you can I mean. okay. yeah. I don't want to overcomplicate when you start getting into some really good definitional issues when you're talking about not-for-profits versus for-profit and how you get into that. So it's going to take a little bit of wordsmithing. Okay. Okay. How do you prove that? <laughs> well, they're going to have to work on that. A little bit of wordsmithing. Okay. Okay. A lot of it. So we're in agreement for them to take it back and work on it? Well, yeah, plus are doing the three-month permit for them. And then grant no, that, three that's clear direction. Okay. I'll, I'll issue that. Thank you. Are we all clear? Yep. Yes. All right. So what are we doing on yep. this item? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah so can I ask what, what are we are doing on the item? Because do. there are several items included. Are you want to just extract this from the ordinance and adopt <clears throat> the rest? Because yes. otherwise we yes. Okay. Okay. So see if I'll get this right. Um, motion to approve ordinance 2020-08 with the removal of the changes to Section 20, Division Article 20. 3, Division 20, Section 20, Temporary Mobile Vendors, yes. uh, removing those changes to bring back to an, uh, at another date, and then changing the implementation, implementation timeline from 90 days to 180 days. Okay. Friendly amendment. Perfect. Yes. Well, I, don't, I don't support the, I think 90 days is enough. I don't support the 180. But if someone needs to go through the process, the conditional use process, it'll take them 
probably 180 days to get through that process for any of the changes that we have. That, that's the only reason I was fine with it. I, I'm, I'm going to do a competing then. Okay. Same motion, but I want 90 days because I feel like we've been talking about this for two years and, you know. Oh. You got to get a second before a competing motion. Well, Mr. Trace, I just, if I could, real quick. So the 90 day period has to do with the non conforming status of certain parts of essentially the lighting. It's the lighting. The, the lighting piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. and there is no conditional use ability oh, to get that. When right. we remove the, the food truck, then that's the, the only well, thing that no, happens. That's, that's a different issue in okay. the same code. So the 90 days basically says if you have those lights, those lights in place now, you have 90 days to remove them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with it. 90 days. Okay. There you go. Second. All right. So we have a motion. Council Member Trace, would you like to restate your motion? Okay. Simplicity. Uh, motion to approve ordinance 2020-08 with the removal of uh, the changes to Article 3, Division 20, Section 20 for the temporary mobile food vendors to bring that forward at a later date. And then for staff to look into um, updates for that mobile food vendor for not-for-profits. Not second. We have a second from Councilmember Raskew. You still have a competing motion? Are you satisfied? No, because he agreed to me. All right, he agreed to it. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? Madam Clerk, we please call the roll. Deputy Member Matheny? Aye. Council Member Askew? Aye. Council Member Trace? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Brings us to Council Action Number 2. Discussion of possible action regarding appointments to boards and committees with vacancies and expiration terms. Before you would have a zoning, the first uh, sheet on your handout is Zoning Board of Adjustment. This is a non coterminous uh, board, and we have five seats that are up for uh, renewal. Two of those have um, indicated they don't want to reapply. So you'll see the applicants that we have. Um, and the, these really are not, they're mainly at large seats, so that, but you can do them in any way. What I'd like to do is like have nominations and then a motion to approve the nomination. So for we each have seat. one vote for each board. One vote for each board. Okay. Well, I'd like to nominate Norma Vasquez to be reappointed to seat number one. David Welty, seat two. Seat three. Is that Mr. Cooper's seat? I'm sorry. Uh, this is a non coterminous board, so it's not per seat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So anyone at large could do that one if they wanted. Jillian Gilmer, seat three. Okay. Three. Uh, come, come again. He's already, he's already serving. He's seat seven. He's at large. Are you moving? Are you? Yeah. Nominating Julian Gilmer for seat three, is that correct? Yeah. So he'd move from a, uh, an alternate position. No, we don't have any alternates. There aren't alternates. It just says at large is appointment seven? is also. It does. Oh, I see. It's confusing. It is confusing. But so he's already on the committee. But yeah. he's expiring, so. Yeah. We just reappoint him when he comes um, back up. Yeah. Okay, Gary Jahandro, seat three. Are you nominating Gary for what? Seat three. Seat three. Seat three. Seat six. Seat four. That doesn't change. Uh, that doesn't change. expire. Doesn't expire. Seat five doesn't expire. Seat number six is is open. They're not applying. I just wonder if a couple of those that it's their second choice, if they have time to do both, if they get appointed to their first choice board. Well, the Zoning Board of Adjustments doesn't meet every month, okay. only when they do case by case. Okay, I'd like to appoint uh, Nanette Douglas to seat six. Nanette Douglas for seat five. Uh, 
Six. six. I mean, a six, rather. Is it everybody? Yep. That's it. So if you could just take a motion as to those, all those appointments. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Askew. Yep. And a second from Council Member Matheny. Madam Clerk. Council Member Askew. Aye. Council Member Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. The next board is the Planning Commission. We I'd like to nominate Bruce. Rosa Holloway okay. for seat one. John Del Delulo, seat two. Seat three, Marion Carney. Okay. And we have seat four expiring. No. no. We just have oh, alternate it expires one. at 21. I see. I'm sorry. Alternative. Alternative one. Alternate one, Carmelo. That seat is. She's reapplying as well. She's requesting a reappointment. Mm -hmm. Do I have a recommendation? I'd recommend we reappoint her. Thank you. Okay. Any other changes? <coughs> mm -mm. I make a motion that we uh, approve the planning commission as stated. Second. And a second from Councilman Brasco. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Member Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. So your next is the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee. That one is coterminous, although we only have an alternate seat that is um, <coughs> expiring and that one is not reapplying. So. Okay. We have one person who's applied, David Taylor. Yeah. We have two. We have two. I recommend we add David Taylor in alternate number two. Second. Councilmember Trace? Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny? Aye. Councilmember Askew? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Motion carries 4 Can I ask a question on that? You, on your list, you're showing this roommate as wanting to be an applicant for that committee also. We just have David Taylor. Oh, the one that was in there. Okay. Maybe so, I have an old version. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, Parks and Rec. We're on That's the Parks tree, and Rec. tree advisory. You're oh, I'm sorry. Parks we're and Rec. We're turning now to the tree advisory. Just moving through the night. <laughs> okay, now we're going to the tree advisory committee. We have two alternates. We have Phyllis uh, Friedland, who's not applying. Do we have a nomination? We Tabitha Rubin for alternative one. Second. We have. And then, do you want to put David Taylor as uh, alternate two? Sure. Yep. All right. Who made the motion? We have Tabitha Rubin as alternate one and David Taylor as alternate two. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Matheny, second Councilmember Askew, Madam Clerk. Deputy Mayor Matheny? Aye. Councilmember Askew? Aye. Councilmember Trace? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Motion carries 4 0. The next board you have is a historic board. I would make a motion for uh, Paula Stark to be stay on there. I'd say Tony, seat five. Tony Jones, seat six. Okay. Richard Kalar, seat seven. Alternate number one. Elizabeth uh, Lemung. Okay. Elizabeth Lemug. Alternate number one. And alternate number two. Jeffrey, Jeffrey. Gerstlauer. Jeffrey. Gerstenlauer. Gerstenlauer. Mm -hmm. Alternate number two. Motion approved. Have second. Motion, have a motion from Councilmember Trey, second from Councilmember Matheny. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Brings us to our CRA board. Seat seven at large. And that is occupied by Joel Davis, who is requesting a reappointment.
You have a motion? And there, there are three um, other applicants. There is one that has a first choice. And we just appoint him to another committee. He, he, he should be able to say when, uh, serve on this committee also. <coughs> well, I know one of the issues was Mr. Davis had a, an ethics complaint uh, or an ethics charge filed against him. And uh, I talked with Mr. Davis about that. He said he paid the fine. He got his paperwork in. It was uh, he, for, he failed to submit his financial paperwork. Um, and... The question is, are we going to reappoint him? If sir, okay, ma'am. Where, where, where is that at? I did it. The and the ethics complaint. What? Can you get a little history of that. There was a you know, and as the mayor pointed out. Uh, Mr. Davis failed to file timely file his financial form that you're all used to filing, right. uh, and uh, ultimately, as I understand it, did did pay did file and did pay the fine. However, because of the involve because of the process and how long it took for him to file it, the ethics commission investigated the matter and found probable cause as to a willful and intentional violation of the uh, uh, of the requirement in the statute to file a financial form. There was a hearing held on it in front of a in front of a hearing judge, uh, an administrative law judge. The ju that administrative law judge had received evidence on it and then um, issued an order and found that there was a willful and intentional violation of the statute related to the uh, filing of the financial form and recommended to the governor that he be removed from his position on the community redevelopment agency. It's our understanding that the governor. It's been was transmitted to the governor. Actually, it was transmitted to the last governor. The last governor. And that there, because that's how long that's how long the process was, and um, the governor had, has to date not taken any action on that recommended order from the administrative law judge. Any recommendation? Well, you know, I have mixed emotions on this. Mr. Davis has been a, um, a good addition to the CRA board because of his experience, his knowledge. Um, uh, he says that he's paid his fine. He's got the paperwork submitted that he was neglectful in doing. Um, and he has certainly requested that we consider reappointing him. Uh, and I just really struggle with this one. Good man. So can the so it's basically it's still sitting on the governor's desk. It sounds like. Is yes, that sir. It, okay, so he, the governor can pull the trigger anytime. Any, any time. Knock him out. Okay. Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> What's your pleasure? Dan, you, the city attorney might want to um, advise that until somebody is reappointed on this seat, that person remains in that seat. Does that continue on this board also? That That is an accurate statement of what typically happens. However, I would, I, I, I would caution that it wouldn't, a, a potential vote by the CRA board, which as you know, has a great deal of responsibility, uh, could be challenged because of that, because technically he wasn't been reappointed. That general theory applies and for advisory committees and, and things, but the CRA board is responsible for the, uh, you know, the, the CRA funds, and so it, would, it could be susceptible to a challenge if you had a member sitting on the board. I would, 
if you were not to reappoint anybody to the seat, I would suggest to you that it would probably be our advice to the CRA board that Mr. Davis not participate in the meetings until such time as he's been reappointed and the seat just remained vacant. Councilman Mothini. So is there anything that Mr. Davis can do to like clear up the issue at the governor's office? He feels he has because I talked to him today. I know he does. I, I want Mr. Davis on this, this, um, the CRA. I mean, I appreciate his counsel when we discuss things. I, I feel like he's a valuable asset and, you know, I don't know particulars of anybody's situation except your own. Right. Um, but it seems like I mean, if somebody doesn't turn that in, can they, like, never be on another committee ever again in their whole life? I mean, that seems... Well, it, no, that's not the case. So and it's like if it's on a letter, but the governor hasn't enacted it, I mean, I, I just... I mean, is there any way to to see if that can be cleared up? Well, the, the purpose of the administrative law judge hearing was to give the Mr. Davis, who was the one that was alleged to have violated the, the, the ethics statute, the, the opportunity to clear it up. And that's what, that, that's what the due process piece is in there. So uh, the, the, there isn't anything that prohibits this council from reappointing him. He he's, meets the criteria, he's qualified to be in terms of the, the CRA uh, statute to serve on the, on the board. So the only issue is, is if the governor, if you appoint him tonight and then the governor decides tomorrow that uh, he's going to remove him from the board, then we'll be back having this discussion again as to who's going to sit on the board. Since once he's been removed from the board, um, you know, he can't, this, this, this council couldn't reappoint him. Well, actually, I'm not. That so I might actually have to look at whether you could or not. As I'm saying that, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know. I'd have to look at that. Yeah. Because our financial reporting is pretty vanilla. It's not like it really has any real details. So it seems to me like a harsh sentence that you can't serve on a board even when you, we, you've submitted it and you've paid your fine. Yeah. He just said he was neglectful. It wasn't like he committed a right. terrible crime or did something illegal. And he's paid a fine, a $1,500 fine he paid. $1,500, yeah. And submitted his work. Yeah. And to do the paperwork, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it's not like the paperwork, ha you know, it's not like it's got any big secrets in it. It's pretty low level. Well, do you want to make a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion to reappoint Joel Davis. I'll make a second. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Councilmember Trace? Nay. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny? Oh, aye. <laughs> sorry, I was <laughs> counting out. Um, ask you, what was your vote again? I'm sorry. Aye. aye. Three to one. one. Motion carries three to one. <clears throat> Okay, the next sheet we have, just to um, advise you, the Economic Development Advisory Committee has one vacancy, but we didn't get any applicants for that board. What I can do is what I've done in the past is anyone that didn't get selected tonight, ask them if they were interested in this board, and then we'll come back with that. Um, also, I, it's come to my attention that Metro Plan um, has a Citizen Advisory Committee that also has a vacancy that we need. We can also ask if anybody wants to do that board also. Okay. And bring those two back to you, if you'd like. Do you have anything else for us? No, nope, that's it. Mr. Manzaris. I do not have anything, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Sturgeon. I think we should. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, two, two updates. First, on the hotel, I spoke to the building official today. He actually spoke to the uh, structural engineering firm um, from AD, ADM, and um, they found some engineering problems with the design. Actually, they'd put the elevator facing the wrong way, so they're going to have to resubmit the plans in another two weeks, they said. Sorry. 
So, and the building official talked to him very sternly and said, we need to have some forward movement on this project. The secondly is the downtown phase two. As you know, we had a state funding agreement with the state of Florida. That gave us $300,000 appropriation. There was a lot of hoops we had to jump through to do that, cause us to go behind in our design phase. Um, but right now, we're supposed to have 30% plans um, in several days on the 17th, 60% plans in June, 90% plans in September, and final plans in October. And then we'll be right into the holiday season, and it's come to my attention that we probably need to engage the downtown business group before we go out to bid to make sure we don't interfere with their optimal time for their selling their wares. So I'd like to sit down with him and kind of come up with that plan. So probably looking at late spring next year before we commence this. And I just want to give them a chance to, I think we did good last time working with our downtown business group, but we want to make sure we don't, we can impact them even less if we can work that out. Excellent. Anything else? No, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Matheny. Um, thank you for the update, um, Mr. Surgeon. Are we going to be able to review like a typical section of the, what we're proposing downtown, just like we did on the first yes, day so we can kind of see? And hopefully the downtown businesses are going to be super excited because now they see uh, like what we're <coughs> heading towards. I think it was probably harder the first time because, you know, there's been a lot of promises along the way and things like that. So I'm hoping that that goes pretty smooth. Yes, ma'am. We will be able to do that. I have a couple, I have a couple items. Um, one, the city manager and I had talked about this before, but I just wanted to bring it up and see like what everybody else felt like. Sometimes I feel like it's a challenge that we serve on so many boards and like we're like, the recommending board and then we're the board receiving the recommendations I, and I feel like that's not really the best setup for me like I feel like you know <laughs> we should get a bigger cross-section so I was gonna see how the council feels about moving off of the CRA board and getting like a, its own CRA board to make recommendations to us as council like I didn't know if anybody had any inclination towards that how many years till it sunsets 2031 so Unless it's years. extended, I just I just would like to have more input into it than you know we're we're reviewing it on both sides. Well, just rem just if I may clarify one thing, your C there are two ways to create a CRA. One is the way it is created. It's another is to be specifically as uh, appointed citizens. But you do not review their they are not recommendations to you as a That's council. Yeah. All right. So okay. so it's not like you're planning and zoning. So if you do. If it is a non-elected official CRA board, we obviously would have to change the enabling legislation for it, uh, but you wouldn't see it again as city council. So, I mean, how hard is changing enabling legislation? I don't know how difficult that is. Is it's that just, just like you change the paperwork? No, we have to bring it back from you at a public hearing. And do it. <laughs> it sounds like not just I know it sounds like oh, it's going to be so difficult. Anyways, that's just no. I just not. my thoughts. Um, I didn't know. I wanted to see what everybody else kind of felt like. It, it wouldn't be a recommending body, though. No, it wouldn't. I just heard okay. him clarify that. Yeah. But I don't know. I feel like sometimes we're we're too involved on every side of every decision where I, I feel like it would be better to get other input. I'll have to think about that one. Mr. Benzeris, you have anything else for us? Uh, no, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. Your thoughts? Well, well, you just brought up it's sunsetting in the... 2031 can't we as a board ask to an extension of what's the extension five ten years well we we can we'll have to go back to the county and renegotiate the interlocal agreement and, and, right and if we want to do that yes yeah why wouldn't we do that now while we're a little bit farther out can yeah, we can certainly can should we have that conversation and go okay and i and i don't i don't mind looking at the um, Citizens living on that board, it just uh, sometimes it worries me that you know you got basically a little over a million bucks a year, and you they end up doing something and like we a, don't like a giant accessory structure behind something, you know. <laughs> I like those <laughs> with, with, a, with an EVM. <laughs> right. uh, Jeez, yeah, okay, just a thought. To think about yeah. Just a thought. Second thing is um, Osceola County is doing a bunch of road projects, as you all know. And I did um, talk to the city manager. Are we coordinating with the county on the roads that fall within our utility service area to design and have prepared for construction at the same time the road is under construction, any utility improvements that we need within those corridors? And I'm not sure that we are um, from just what I've been hearing in right. the uh, 
atmosphere. So I would like us to do that, you know, like to work with the county and any roads that fall within our service area that we need. For example, Neptune Road, right. a portion of that falls within our utilities. And I know the area that I live in, there's no reuse on Neptune, but they're going to be widening that section. So to me, it would be smart that we are working ahead and getting plans ready to go out to bid with their road plans. And just wanted to see if you guys agreed with that and to give direction to the city manager. <clears throat> yeah. Or I, evaluate I, it and come back. I mean, I just feel like I've been told that the city is saying, no, we don't have the money. Yeah, and that, I just want to make sure that we're, it's not coming from Mr. Wheeler. <laughs> but it is. What you heard is we've told uh, Commissioner Grieb, it's not a good business decision for us to extend sewer to the homes on Alligator on uh, Fish Lake. They, she very much wants to sewer the houses that are on septic tank that are on that north side of Neptune because they do have some impact on the nutrient uh, loading on, on the lake. But you're talking about basically about a dozen homes. You're talking about well over a million dollars to get sewer. To I them. actually am not talking about that. That's I'm, not what I've heard. I'm, but but that's that, but that's a communication on Nept. We have told them on Neptune that we do want to do water and, and reclaim, but we've told them we don't want to do we okay. don't want to do. We don't well, want I just sewer. want to make sure we're coordinating so we're not caught flat-footed mm -hmm. when they're like, "Hey, we're ready to go to bid," and we're like, "Oh shoot, we didn't like, put the money aside." Like to like, Road, there wasn't more force being put up Narcusa Road than I had to go in the median yeah. after it was built. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, are we all in agreement to like look ahead and? It, it makes sense. Work is it, on is what part we can. settlement on the list, or is that? Yeah. Yes. Part and settlement, Neptune. Um, those were the two I was thinking about specifically. Yeah. But. And on the master plan, it shows water main connecting around Fish Lake there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So you've got direction on that. Correct. The last thing I wanted to bring up was I brought this up with our CRA, but it didn't really seem to. No one seemed to be interested in it. So I want to bring it up again. But I still think that we should have a conversation with the church on 10th Street about utilizing their land that they have for a parking garage. And, you know, to me, it's like we're, we're spending all this money on New York, then we're spending money on Pennsylvania. And then, you know, of course, parking is a problem that we all know that we have. And the church has this big surface lot. So maybe we could go and work with them and say, hey, what if we build a parking garage on your property we don't buy the property we build it on your property so um that saves us money and then however many lots they have in their surface lot let's say they have 100 i don't know how many they have you know so they get 100 spaces in the parking garage and then we get everything above that and then you know we want florida avenue to have that bike trail on it we've got that wine place that's coming in on florida and 10th i just feel like it kind of expands our footprint and uh, to me, it seems like a viable idea of something we can do. I know the city is looking into some other locations, but to me, it's like, well, we're going to take that off tax rolls then. We put a um, something behind the hotel. But I would at least like to have a conversation with the church to see, are they amenable to the idea? Is it something we could work out? I mean, just at least go have a conversation. So I wanted to see if you guys would have a consensus to have the city manager go talk with the church and see if there's something we could do. Maybe it's not a viable option. I don't have a problem with that. You know, they. I feel like it's a win-win. They get covered parking. We wouldn't have to buy the land, you know. We'd have a bunch of parking downtown. I'd rather have some parking right here, but, you know. You know, my concern would be the ownership of the parking garage. I'm sure all that could be worked out. I mean, I'm sure that's... Yeah. We got a crack attorney over here. He'll handle that. <laughs> crack. I think you have a consensus to... Okay. To just so you're good? Understood. Okay. That's it for me. Done? Just remember ask you. Uh, nothing for me, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Trace. Uh, along the same lines as Deputy Mayor Matheny's comments, uh, what's the status of the City Hall master plan? Was anyone working what on that? City what Hall City Hall master plan? plan? When we were running out of space, everyone said that we're good, putting together a, a master plan for City Hall and the poor campus. Garage, et cetera. I figured that would show. Mayor, Mr. Anderson. Yeah. <laughs> he's walking up slowly, so that's He's trying to think. think. He's trying to think. Uh, I was hoping I could get out without those tough questions. So the City Hall Master Plan has sort of been 
on the sort of the back burner because of other priorities. However, I had a conversation with the deputy city manager and we're going to go ahead and um, outsource it because we just don't have the staff to devote time to it at this point. Also, as you probably the city manager already mentioned, we're also doing the matrix study, which will also feed into the whole um, planning of how many employees we have and where they are and so on. So it's kind of yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Sturgeon. I wasn't grunting at you, Mayor, sorry. <laughs> the uh, other thing we've done is to, we're doing a, a SEPTED analysis, security of the entire building, and we've got plans, preliminary plans to enclose the atrium out here for a single point of entry for security reasons. So we're working on that also. Okay. Yeah. And then on um, the public works update that gets sent out um, kind of once a month, on um, Mutter Road, uh, I forget what the official um, thought process was on that, but so we're just making that an emergency road? Or were we going to have some public hearings or some community meetings about what to actually do there? Whether it's a full connection with a light out on Okanagan Creek or just an emergency road or just, just a trail? Go ahead, Nassim. Hello, sir. That was well before you. Sorry. Oh, well, my pleasure, sir. Nassim Gendor, Public Works Director. So at Mutter Road, uh, we are re-engaging with Osseo Engineering, uh, who did the initial design uh, to uh, provide preliminary design for a, uh, a, a pedestrian path uh, that will allow access for emergency vehicle, um, yeah, emergency vehicle access mm -hmm. from uh, Mutter Road to Peghorn Way. On that, um, the track that's uh, the track that connects uh, Mutter Road and Peghorn Way is designated Parks and Rec track. Uh, so, pro uh, providing a pedestrian a pedestrian and bicycle pathway uh, meets the intent of that, and then vehicle access uh, with um, bollards design or a system designed to only allow emergency vehicles to go from Mutter Road to the uh, St. Cloud Hospital and vice versa, um, Peghorn Way. Because we kind of adopted a. A transportation master plan that talks about interconnectivity and some other things, and then we, an op opportunity we have for interconnectivity, we just kind of <coughs> keep it cut off. So I just didn't know if we wanted to talk about that or try to figure out a, a specific path we want to move forward on that. I don't, I don't, like, the I don't like the fact that it's an only emergency access instead of a full, full connection. From Buttinger all the way over to Old Canoe Creek. Okay, so to clarify that, you're, you're, you you clarify you're asking uh, you'd rather have it to be a full access road, I, or is that just like a normal roadway pro uh, process? You'd have have some public meetings, talk about it, make sure that everything's all designed properly, but then have a full connection between the two. Yes. Okay. Well, that would, some uh, of the issues we're having now with the section of Old Canoe Creek cut mm -hmm. off, it it just creates. A nightmare, right? We're, we're all we're all going through it now, and then if we have better interconnectivity in some other areas, some of that traffic can dissipate and disperse through other parts of the city. Yes, sir. Uh, that uh, that's correct. And then also uh, the track that uh, the the track that connects Motor Road and Peckham Park is uh, designated for Parks and Rec, so that would have to uh, be redesignated to uh, public use uh, type track. Um, and then uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong uh, for the city attorney, but um, we would have to go through the public hearings in order to, uh, again, some of the stuff that may have happened uh, prior to my time, but we would have to go through the public hearings to ensure that that use would be, uh, we would be able to get, uh, able, we would be able to uh, get support for that use. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, probably as well as engage on an actual analysis to determine um, the, uh, how the, the, benefit of the benefit of the actual roadway. On, in terms of that, uh, of you know the cross connections and um, uh, for regular vehicle traffic uh, mm -hmm. on that as well. So, perfect. Ms. Matheny. Thank you. So it's funny. I was just talking to them about this before the meeting because I had asked Nassim to update that when the update came out. I don't know. At, anyways, I just said, could you please elaborate on what the change of scope is because it just said change of scope, and then I was talking with the city manager about it. So it's probably before you got on here, Keith, but we ran into a roadblock because the parcel of land we thought we were going to be able to use for the roadway is not is not right away. It's a tract. Mm -hmm. So the thing I wanted to, we didn't finish our conversation because the meeting started here, but the thing I would like to do before we go redo plans again 
is figure out what we can do. I mean, because to me, I deal with I deal with acquisition a lot and with road projects and. You know, I know interpretations I've gotten from attorneys before, which every attorney is a little different. But if it says parks and rec, I'm like, can you even put an emergency path down it? To me, like, I don't really know that you could do that. I, I know our city attorney feels like it's wiggly enough in the language that, that it, it is an allowable use in there. But I would like to figure out the land and exactly what we can do before we go have someone redesign it again. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me to do that. Like go down whatever path you have to do, get whatever assurances that you need that you can do what you plan on doing. And if you want to have public meetings, I mean, you don't need 100% plans for that. You just you get a typical section and you just say, I know that that community was adamantly against a road going through there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and people are already cutting through that neighborhood anyway to get from correct. A to B. So this just actually so it's just it like away from them. But. Yeah, but they are already like, mad about yeah. that but i would like us to figure out exactly what we can do with the land before we go because we've already we had an emergency we had to redesign it and do it like a full-blown section now we're asking them to go back to emergency i mean I, I think we need to figure out the land first and then follow with design mr manzara well i think deputy mayor Matheny is correct we need to figure out exactly what we want to do it however <clears throat> There is an avenue to do more if that's what you really want. We just need direction from the council on how you want to proceed. You, there is, you know, we have this, condemn, condemning authority, don't we? Exactly right. So. And that's, my, that's where I was headed is that, if, as Mr. Trace pointed, if you want this to be a full vehicular roadway through there, there's a process to do that that the city could avail itself of. Can and, you come with an, uh, like a ballpark cost for us? Like... Is eminent domain. If you get into condemning, I mean, it can get very, very, mm -hmm. very, very, very expensive. Yeah. But I, mean, I can give you. I can. Give, we could give you an a, a, an idea of the cost to go through the process to see how much roadway, how much private property would have to be acquired mm -hmm. to uh, you know to to put the put a road through there, uh, and then we could give you a sort of a, a ballpark based on some other things that we've been involved in and do that. Uh, what I can't quantify you, for you is the public reaction to it. Damages. Yeah. Mr. Sturgeon. Yes, thank you. First off, I'm, I'm proud to say that the project list going out helps spur these conversations, so that I'm proud that we're doing that. Secondly, remember, we, we do have a $900,000 appropriation from the House and the Senate right now that's in conference for this project. So I, I need direction so we can get this done. And, and like I said, I, I agree with Deputy Mayor. These decisions were made in consultation with the city attorney. And we didn't just shoot from the hip. So if we want to go in a different direction, I need to know that just to make sure if we do get that appropriation finalized and if a governor signs it, we can move forward quickly. Well, the last thing I heard before I saw the update that said that the strategy had changed, and I don't recall an update on the strategy changing, but um, was that we were going to go try to acquire that piece of land. And so I, I know I, I never heard any kind of like, follow through with that like I know it kind of goes into like does the developer still own it or has it switched over to the HOA and you know exactly how you got to do that I mean I would like some I would like some alternatives so that we could make some decisions on it well if the council would like to consider the the eminent domain or condemnation proceedings we certainly can update you on that and give you some idea of what uh, of what that process would be and what the you know the ultimate cost would be outside of construction of the infrastructure of the road we leave that up to the seam and his group but we can tell you what the what what the acquisition cost would be in the process and how long it would take to deal with that certainly can't we haven't done it because we weren't sure the council wanted to move in that direction if it's identified on the transportation master plan as a needed connection I feel like we need to I mean we we have powers of condemnation. So. Absolutely, and if you've identified it on your transportation plan, that makes the, mm -hmm. the necessity determination a lot easier because you've already made the determination that it's a needed roadway, which is one of the things you have to do when you're proving a condemnation. So what kind of direction do we need to give you at this point? Well, I, I, I don't think any of them, we haven't done a condemnation proceeding since any of you have been up there. It They are... They are difficult matters, and the, and the public doesn't typically respond well to them. Uh, so we would caution you and say that we would like some appetite, some direction from the council that you would like to consider this, and there's an, 
you know, somewhat of an appetite to consider. I, I just want to. Can you give us a matrix like yeah. of ideas and? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And routes. I, I, I don't want to go down the 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 eminent domain process. We can run title work. We can figure out. I mean, if you just spend some time thinking about it and looking at it, and then we can reset oh, sure it can. in a couple sure. weeks. Yeah. I would rather have like a matrix. If you do this, here's what you can do. Yeah. If you do that, here's what you can yeah, do. Yeah, and you know? if we could, we'd rather do that at a workshop if possible. Perfect. Um, and then my last thing is. Um, do we have an objection to that? Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then my last thing is um, we have our strategic planning session next Thursday, right? So um, if we could get a uh, copy of the quarterly update for the business plan. So we can all go through it before um, yep. before the meeting. We just finished that up today. We'll send that out tomorrow. Perfect. Thank you. I'd like to remind all of you who have remained to the end that we are wearing these special shirts. <laughs> and a census is very important to our city as well as to the entire county. And uh, we need everyone... Uh, to help support that, get the word out. I think there are opportunities for employment uh, that you can pursue. And uh, do you have any other counsel for us regarding the census? No, sir. We'll get a picture. She wants and a picture. We're working with the county and other entities to get the word out. So again, support the census. Make sure you fill can out. Can you wait until we get through, and then we'll uh, at the very end we'll let you take a picture. Uh, Mr. Sturgeon, I know that you and I've talked about. Uh, this resin that is in the water and you know we've had tests that have come from the water department and so on is, is there anything else that we can do or should do to find out the impact of this resin that uh, is potentially in the water uh, to the health of our residents what else can we do can we pursue some we actually just in uh, just approved a scope of work with Reese Engineering, and they have a specialized lab. I don't know if they could help us with that. I'll let Brian speak to that. But uh. yeah, I had a discussion with the people from Reese who have a continuing contract with us and do some work, and and they told me that they have been doing some uh, water quality work with Orange County and Toho, and that they have a an association with a, a lab that has does electron spectrum. Something spectrometer. <laughs> spectrometer. <laughs> and anyway, that uh, that they have the ability to do some pretty uh, in-depth analysis, and so they've offered to work with us on some of that. So I think that's one one things we'll look at to see. Mr. Sturgeon. Yes. Sorry, if I could expand on that, uh, City Attorney, just remind me of this: we uh, are recommending that we also engage Gray Robinson, uh, Mr. Cloud, to look at. We may have some impact from the manufacturer of the resin of change in the process. And we may have some um, be able to take action against them. So we would like to engage Mr. Cloud's group to go in and look at this from his perspective and from their experts. Well, I certainly think we should. Do we have any objections from the council? What I'm, I'm lost with what the changing of the process was that you're referring to. So Ixum is the manufacturer of the resin, and it's our contention that they changed the process that's causing some film when the uh, resin is put in its raw form into the, into the, to filter the water, there's some kind of film that's being generated. So um, my understanding is that they were bought out by a, another company and made them cut costs, and that was one of their washing procedures that they'd taken out of one of the steps. So before some the, we get it. Before we get it. Sure. Yeah. I say engage them. Did, did I say that right, Mr. Wheeler? Well, I... Just learn some additional facts this evening. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to love it even more now. <laughs> well, is it uh, a little bit along the same lines? Well, it's, it, the, the, what the same is, 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 the, is the resin that we're receiving now has a substantial amount of orange. The orange there's orange water in the resin when you get, and it's and it's a byproduct of the uh, manufacturing process. And I have a, a former a friend and associate who's a professor of water engineering at University of Central Florida. I talked to him today and he uh, told me he's very familiar with the situation and, and that it, a lot of that orange is, is iron oxide, which is not a substantial health issue. But the issue was, this is something we weren't receiving in the resin before. And he told me he thinks a big part of it was changing environmental regulations in Australia prohibited the manufacturing process that they were having and they had to change the manufacturing process as a result of that. And uh, so anyway, we got cut off because 
he cut me off to talk to a graduate student. But anyway, we, we'll get back together okay. to get <laughs> some more some more discussions. Well, it's this issue is unfolding as, 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 as we go. Uh, a large part of the issue of the, of the turbidity out there was, we said, the filters. But it could be also that some of the material we're receiving, even with the filters operating, could not have filtered all the material out. And that's something we want to look into in, in, more, in more depth. You know, so. Yes? Well, I certainly want you to look into that. But you know, a bigger concern is the long-term health implications of, of that resident. I know we've tried to find studies. We looked at the water ourselves, but whatever else you can do, maybe Bray Robinson could help us with that. Yes, sir. OK. Are we any objections to that? No, uh, no, I've been made aware that there'll be a major fundraising activity on March the 1st. At the, it's on a Sunday at the Avatar Car Wash. Mm -hmm. The police department, the fire department, uh, and community volunteers will be there. And the car wash uh, has, will give 50% of all the proceeds to help these two families. And then there'll be other uh, people there uh, trying to raise money for these two families that have been damaged and just wanted to make uh, the community aware uh, of that activity. I'll certainly be sending a notice out to all the churches that are in the area uh, because I know many of them have been helping also. And so uh, we just want to continue to pray for and remember these families. With that, we come to our information section, report section. Thursday, February the 20th, there will be a city council strategic planning section session at 3 p.m. here in council chambers. Thursday, February the 27th, there will be a city council meeting at 6.30 p.m. also here in council chambers. There are two reports for your review, warrant list number six and recreation advisory committee meeting minutes from their September uh, meeting of 2019, and that's been approved. With that, there's nothing else in our agenda. We will be adjourned, and if you'll please gather for a pictures. All you guys that have on T-shirts. <laughs>